everyone. Welcome to Norgen Biotech's first masterclass of 2023. My name is Reagan Back, and I'm one of the senior product specialists here at Norgen. I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. So we're so excited for all of you to join us, and we'll be discussing enhancing precision medicine with liquid biopsy. So to start with, I'm going to launch a poll so we can get an idea of the sample types everyone is working with. Um, so we'll put this up for a minute or two while people are still joining, and then we'll take a look at the results. Okay, thanks for everyone who joined the poll. So it looks like most people here are working with blood and plasma, which is great. Um, we have a few others too. So fortunately, we will be providing our entire liquid biopsy booklet at the end of this presentation, and that'll include all of Norgen's complete workflows for working with a variety of sample types. So you can stay tuned at the end of the webinar for that. In this masterclass, Norgen's very own senior research scientist and director of marketing and sales, Dr. Abdallah, will be joined by our special guest today, Alex Roland, from Cancer Treatment Options and Management, to discuss the importance of precision medicine and precision oncology. Okay, so I'll just quickly go over some of the key learning objectives for today. So first will be the importance of precision medicine and precision oncology. Second will be understanding liquid biopsy for monitoring cancer. The third is understanding the composition of plasma and its utility in cancer diagnostics. Fourth, we will have liquid biopsy for monitoring cancer. And then finally, we will discuss how to address these changes. So with that, I would like to um, bring in Dr. Abdallah to start. Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining today's uh, masterclass webinar talking about uh, enhancing uh, precision medicine using liquid biopsy. Um, just brief uh, introduction about uh, traditional medicine and precision medicine uh, related to cancer. Uh, traditionally, uh, cancer has been treated using um, the commonly used um, chemotherapy. And uh, this is depending on understanding the type of cancer or the uh, cancer type, and then applying uh, regular uh, uh, treatment, uh, which uh, gonna be targeting this cancer uh, location, uh, where this chemotherapy will be uh, trying to eliminate this cancer cells, but also it may cause harm to uh, the uh, normal cells that are surrounding this cancer cells. So it's not targeting the cancer itself, it's targeting the location. And this, depending on the type of cancer, how aggressive is the cancer, um, the causative agent of the cancer, uh, this chemotherapy or this treatment uh, doesn't uh, specifically uh, target the, the type of the cancer or uh, the, uh, uh, the causative agent of the cancer. Uh, cancer is very smart. It's going to be turning on certain genes, uh, turning off certain genes in order to uh, to progress, grow, uh, metastasize, hide. Uh, so all of these things nowadays, they are taken in consideration when applying a specific treatment. So understand precision medicine, basically, uh, to precisely understanding the type of cancer, uh, the genes that are involved in the progression of the cancer or the, um, uh, the, the genes that are causing the cancer either, either by being turned on or turned off. So uh, precisely, uh, we are trying to outsmart the cancer by understanding the genes that are involved in this type of uh, cancer and targeted more precisely. Uh, one of the uh, cancer types that have been um, showing uh, success in treating it uh, using precision medicine, for example, is melanoma. Melanoma is turned on uh, by a gene which has uh, become an oncogene called BRAF, for example, which has 60% of its genes mutated. Uh, so by, uh, and this gene is turned on uh, by uh, and when exposed to sun or sunburn. And knowing exactly the type of genes or the type of mutation that is involved in turning on the gene, we can precisely prescribe medicine 
that can target just genes uh, or these mutations in order to turn it off, and now we control the type of cancer. Uh, in order to understand uh, the type of mutations within these uh, genes uh, specific uh, to certain cancer, uh, uh, we uh, need to understand the genomic alterations that happens to these genes. And this can be done through uh, sampling from uh, this cancer type. Next, please. Next slide, please. So, uh, uh, to sample uh, the uh, sample or the cancer, uh, we either go to tissue biopsy traditionally, uh, where it is an invasive method of sampling uh, the cancer. Uh, it's invasive, um, sometimes requires a surgical operation and it's high cost, not easy to obtain, uh, and it's a long process time to obtain these cancer types. And uh, uh, most of the time, the evaluation of uh, this tissue biopsy is uh, not very accurate because it doesn't have the heterogeneity uh, surrounding this sample type or this cancer. Uh, it is also difficult to tolerate uh, this type of operation, which is uh, acquiring a biopsy, a tissue biopsy during illness. Uh, and also it's difficult to monitor or regularly monitoring uh, these uh, cancer patients during treatment. Uh, therefore, an alternative, uh, a non-invasive alternative to tissue biopsy is liquid biopsy. Liquid biopsy is a minimally invasive sample uh, to a completely non-invasive sample. Uh, some type of these sample uh, liquid biopsy like plasma, which is minimally invasive, it requires collection of blood, or it can be urine, which is highly non-invasive. It could be silver sopranal fluid. It, should, it could be serum, uh, which also requires uh, blood collection, uh, amniotic fluid, uh, saliva. All of these are uh, liquid biopsy sample types that can be used uh, to understand uh, the genomic alteration of the, of the cancer. It's easy to obtain, uh, of course, less costly than a surgical operation in order to acquire tissue biopsy, uh, the processing time is very short, um, low failure rate if it was collected uh, pro properly, uh, it has high tolerance uh, during treatment, uh, you can monitor treatment uh, during the, 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 the term or the period of treatment, uh, the you can have good prognosis uh, or understanding the prognosis. Uh, next, please. Uh, liquid biopsy, such as plasma, for example, and this is uh, true for all of the sample types uh, that is a liquid biopsy type of a liquid biopsy nature, uh, contains a fragmented uh, nucleic acid being fragmented DNA or fragmented RNA. Uh, it contains uh, RNA and DNA uh, released from uh, normal cells and uh, DNA released from cancer cells, and we call them uh, circulating tumor DNA. It is a very short fragment. Uh, my colleague here, Alex, will be going through all of these uh, sizes and types. Uh, also, in the circulation or in the liquid biopsy, you can see uh, circulating tumor cells where if you were, uh, can successfully isolate these circulating tumor cells, you can understand or uh, investigate uh, the genomic content of these uh, circulating tumor cells. Also, a part of cell-to-cell -cell communication, uh, being human cells or normal cells or cancer cells, they communicate through uh, extracellular vesicles. The most common one is exosomes, and the content of the exosomes uh, contains uh, messages where cancer will be communicate cancer cells will be communicating between each other or the cancer cells will send some messages to a neighboring normal cell in order to convert them into a cancer cell so by in a liquid biopsy uh, you can get all of these information to study translocation uh, translocations fusions epigenetic patterns differential gene expression 
um, the amount of the cell-free DNA and cell-free RNA and exosomes in these uh, sample types, uh, liquid biopsy is very uh, low. Uh, that's why it is sometimes very challenging to obtain uh, these uh, type of cell-free nucleic acid from the different types of liquid biopsy. Next. Uh, one one uh, method that is currently used to study uh, these genomic alterations in uh, liquid biopsy is uh, droplet digital PCR. And this is a suggested droplet digital PCR workflow for the uh, understanding for understanding the genomic alterations in, in cancer from liquid biopsy. Uh, my colleague, I believe Alex, will go in details through uh, the droplet digital PCR and their assays. Um, however, it requires cell-free DNA purification, and in order to purify cell-free DNA from liquid biopsy, you need a very sensitive method to uh, purify these very low concentrated, very short fragmented uh, cell-free DNA. Uh, also, you need a very good sample collection method in order to uh, have these uh, cell-free nucleic acid uh, in a good uh, integrity and uh, in a good purity because uh, once you are purified the cell-free DNA from plasma, for example, uh, you're going to go to a very sensitive downstream applications like sequencing or like droplet digital PCR, which requires very high quality uh, genomic uh, content. So DDPCR, you're going to generate the uh, droplets and then you're going to amplify the genes and then you can read these droplets and based on the analysis of these droplets, you can have a precise understanding of these the genomic alterations in these uh, can, uh, nucleic acid or in this nucleic acid uh, for uh, to for better diagnosis for early detection of cancer for uh, prognostic uh, as a prognostic tool as well uh, and then based on this you can uh, personalize the treatment based on uh, the genomic alteration within these uh, this uh, these uh, uh, circulating tumor DNA uh, so it is not uh, one treatment can fit all. It's going to be very personalized. And now the success rate of curing cancer is going to be high than uh, having uh, a one treatment fit all. And also uh, you can, uh, by these methods, you can uh, monitor the disease, the progression of the disease, the metastasis of the disease. So uh, it is a better way to control cancer. Next step, please. Uh, Norgen uh, uh, has a recommended uh, plasma-based workflow uh, that is uh, very highly optimized and suits uh, precision medicine and precision oncology, uh, especially from uh, plasma samples. Uh, we have highly optimized a collection and preservation tube uh, that can preserve cell-free DNA and cell-free RNA uh, in one uh, tube other methods currently available, either they can do cell-free DNA or cell-free RNA, but ours can uh, preserve the cell-free DNA and cell-free RNA and exosomes for an uh, elongated period of time, 30 days at room temperature without any sign of uh, significant hemolysis, uh, especially during shipment uh, of their samples. And this is very important uh, for the quality of the uh, nucleic acid that is going to be purified from these uh, tubes. Uh, following the collection and preservation, we have highly optimized as well our purification and isolation uh, methodology for uh, the purification and isolation of cell-free DNA, cell-free RNA, and exosomes. Uh, unlike other um, methods on the market uh, that are utilizing uh, the uh, uh, silica based technology, uh, we are uh, utilizing in our method our proprietary silicon carbide technology that is very sensitive for capturing a very low amount or ultra low amount of RNA and DNA without any bias towards sizes or sequences. Uh, our technology uh, can uh, capture uh, nucleic acid in the single cell level without the use of RNA carrier, especially if you're going to be using sequencing. Uh, RNA carrier now is going to be problematic if you use that. Silica-based technology is not sensitive enough to capture 
very low amount of RNA without the use of RNA carriers. And if you didn't use RNA carriers, you are not going to be getting to the uh, levels of the nucleic acid uh, in such uh, cell-free liquid biopsy. Uh, normally, the cell-free liquid biopsy uh, the content uh, of nucleic acid is very low. As I mentioned, it's in the picogram range, 1 to 100 picogram range, so it's very wide. Uh, there is no specific or typical yield that is going to be found in plasma. Uh, or any cell-free liquid biopsy. That's why you uh, need a very sensitive method that will capture all sizes without any bias, uh, all sequences without any bias, uh, silica-based technology, uh, along with phenochloroform, uh, which we don't utilize in any of our uh, uh, kits, um, uh, tends to uh, bind uh, more efficiently large molecular weight nucleic acid on the expense of small nuclei or small molecular weight or small size uh, fragments also it tends to buy uh, to bind or have a bias towards binding uh, um, sequences with high gc content and they miss some of the small uh, or rna that has uh, low gc content our silicon carbide technology doesn't exhibit that bias so with the silicon carbide technology uh, that is employed in our purification and isolation kits uh, combined with the collection and preservation uh, device for the uh, collecting uh, plasma cells or um, um, preserving the cell-free nucleic acid, uh, it is highly guaranteed that you're going to get the highest uh, purity, highest quality, and highest concentration from these plasma samples. Uh, following this, and in order to complete the workflow, uh, we we do have uh, optimized our uh, RNA uh, library preparation kits, especially for the small RNA sequencing uh, that can deal with ultra-low RNA inputs down to probably 60 picogram per microliter. Uh, we offer this as a service, and also we offer this uh, as a product. Uh, we provide uh, researchers and labs uh, with our small RNA library preparation kits uh, in order to utilize it in their uh, facilities. Also, we receive samples from uh, around the world. And as I will mention, we receive some samples from him uh, to do uh, our services for either, either the isolation of the nucleic acid from these difficult uh, sample types. Uh, and also we do some sequencing. So um, now I'm going to handle my the slides to Alex so he can talk more about uh, uh, CTOM's achievements uh, towards precision medicine and precision technology and their essays that have been developed uh, to uh, outsmart the cancer. Uh, thank you everyone and uh, here you go Alex. Can everyone hear me? Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Abdallah. Um, I'm very excited to be here today. Um, I can honestly say without um, this wonderful partnership with Norgen over the last you know, four or five years, I don't think we would have been able to achieve anything that we have. So I'm going to talk about um, what we've developed in our liquid biopsies and where things are going right now. Next slide, please. So um, quite a few years ago, probably about four or five years ago, we were trying to develop a, a ctDNA um, liquid biopsy so we could monitor cancer patients um, both uh, prognostically and to see um, in regards to the efficacy of certain drugs and also to determine recurrence. So uh, this is a picture of my partner, Nushin Mashkabadi, and she worked very hard with me tirelessly. We spent quite a bit of time trying all of these different kits uh, for our digital PCR platform. Uh, we weren't able to obtain enough DNA uh, until one day um, I had a chance to read a paper that showed Norgen's products and I immediately contacted them and we started using their uh, CTDNA kit 
Um, and we, we managed to, it was one of the first kits that allowed us to get proper amounts of, of CT DNA. Uh, and then additionally, we started using their, their tubes. And prior to that, we'd been using a few different collection tubes, uh, Shrek tubes and so on. And at maximum, we're getting about three or four uh, millimeters of, um, uh, milliliters of uh, plasma, which wasn't quite enough. Um, uh, Norgen had created a workflow for us to work with, um, which required at least four uh, milliliters. Um, and um, it, was, uh, it was a new product for them. It's called the MIDI kit at the time. Uh, and it allowed us to get enough uh, so we could do our CT DNA liquid biopsies. So using their, uh, once we started using their uh, collection tubes, things really changed. We started getting like seven milliliters uh, and up of plasma from a single blood tube. So next slide, please. So uh, in order to create a proper assay to monitor cancer, um, you need to really consider the source. So, uh, you know, the source of CT DNA, uh, circulating tumor DNA or, or cell-free DNA in general, uh, it can occur through apoptosis, you know, normal programmed cell death, uh, necrosis due to uh, treatments or just, uh, you know, uh, the way cells die sometimes. It can occur from circulating tumor cells, uh, circulating healthy cells, and of course, exosomes, which are released by cells um, to uh, communicate with each other. Next. So in order to uh, determine your source and determine where uh, your CT DNA or your circulating or your cell-free DNA is coming from, um, it's important to consider the size. Size does matter here. And so um, when you have a cell that uh, goes through the process of apoptosis, it usually releases circulating uh, DNA in, you know, roughly in the size of about 100 to 200 base pairs. Necrosis, um, due to treatment potentially, uh, often leads to much larger fragments in the you know, 10, 10 kilobase uh, range. Circulating tumor cells, um, interestingly enough, and I have um, the BRAF V600E uh, variant here. So the V is the normal, the valine is the normal wild type, and then the E is the mutated uh, LL. And this creates uh, a, a situation of um, uh, uh, constitutive signaling. In short, the BRAF V600E mutation results in a, a change in the four-dimensional conformational structure of the protein, and it stays attached to its uh, signaling member. So if you notice here, I had the circulating tumor cell. Um, the E is highlighted here because that's the mutation. So that allele is usually between 132 and 145 base pairs, whereas the wild-type allele, uh, which is the one below it, the V, uh, is usually 165 uh, plus base pairs. So this creates a great way of determining whether, um, you know, what sort of sizes uh, you want to optimize for. And so exosomes can contain DNA um, from anywhere from 100 base pairs to 20 kilobase pairs. Next slide, please. So here is a uh, study that was done quite a while ago. Um, and it uh, basically what it was is where they looked at the cell-free DNA um, from uh, melanoma patients and healthy donors. And as you can see, um, the, the peak for the uh, melanoma patients is around 145 base pairs, and then the healthy donors is up around 165. So what we're clearly seeing here is a, a size, a selective size difference in um, DNA that's released from tumor cells versus the wild type. Next slide, please. So we tried many extraction kits, as I mentioned previously. Uh, we tried the EpiQuick, uh, the KiAmp, uh, the MagMax, um, XCF Complete. We actually also tried, um, you know, most of them are mag magnetic bead based, uh, but we also tried a couple of other um, uh, silicone based tubes um, that just didn't get us enough DNA to really work with. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? So this is from a study that I read. Um, I believe it was about 2016 or so, or 2017, oh, 2018. Um, I'm not sure if this was the actual study or if this is the first study. Uh, I know there's a few studies done on this, but it compared the um, size fragments um, from all the different kits. These are all magnetic bead-based kits. And I noticed with Norgen that while it uh, collected um, you know, a variety of different sizes, it seemed to enhance 
the sizes we're looking for. In other words, the small fragments, um, the you know the the tumor ones. So it seemed to optimize that, and that's why you know one of the reasons we uh, decided to start working with this. It also produced a lot of DNA for us too. Next. So uh, a little bit about exosomes. I'm sure you've all heard of them. They're the most exciting new development in cancer. Um, it's a way that cells can communicate with each other. Uh, we believe that cancer cells uh, um, set up metastasis using exosomes. Um, so what's the connection with uh, ctDNA? Um, if you look at the internal volume of an exosome, I mean, it's not that big. It's, uh, it's very small. So when you think of the size of your typical DNA fragment, a tumor DNA fragment, let's say, uh, you know, 145 base pairs is what we're looking for. Um, you'd think, okay, well, how does an exosome carry that? Um, because given that size, it couldn't carry more than about 500 to 700 molecules. So if exosomes are more abundant in cancer and disease, which we know they are, and they're released by tumor cells when they metastasize, we know, we know that's true too, why don't they carry more DNA? Next slide, please. So once again, um, the data suggests that most ctDNA under 150 base pairs, and so that's tumor DNA, is associated with exosomes. So uh, that's specific to tumor DNA. So how does, how does this work then? Are exosomes and ctDNA really associated? Well, what we now know is that the DNA is attached to the outer membranes and, and the exterior of the exosomes as well, um, and also a little bit on the crown of the exosomes. Now, um, you know, that makes perfect sense because membranes are often associated with free-floating pieces of DNA. Um, DNA can pass through membranes, it can attach to membranes, but I think the most important finding is that um, exosomes have in their uh, membrane, and you can look this up in uh, Vesiclopedia, uh, they have over 35 different DNA binding proteins. And so that really helps us understand how this works. So it's uh, not so much that the exosomes carry the DNA, the circulating tumor DNA or the, the cell-free DNA in the actual exosome itself, but it's attached to the membranes and attached to the crowns and it floats along. So we don't really know if the DNA is released with the exosome or if it's released at the same time and then it's attracted to the exosome membrane, or um, you know, if uh, the exosomes themselves pick up the circulating DNA, uh, we don't quite know that. Um, we, we assume that it's released at the same time. But what we now know is that circulating tumor DNA is attached to the exosomes. And what's important there is these exosomes that are gonna be released from a tumor cell are gonna be a representation of that specific cell. And as you know, tumors have massive amount of heterogeneity. So if uh, you know, one tumor cell has a certain set of mutations and a certain um, uh, you know, set of different overexpressed genes, um, that's gonna be found and represented in that specific exosome. So if you cast a wide net and you're getting uh, exosomes from the blood, there's a good chance you're gonna capture a lot of the heterogeneity of a, a highly metastatic cancer. So uh, next slide, please. So a little talk about uh, digital PCR. I'm sure you've all heard about it. Um, basically the technology for digital PCR, uh, it used to be, well, I mean, a lot of companies use uh, little bubbles and the PCR reaction occurs in a bubble with a piece of DNA and all of the reagents. Um, we use a chip-based technology. It basically has 20,000 different wells uh, it's from Thermo Fisher, it's a great technology. Uh, and it uses the TACMAN probes, as you probably know. TACMAN probes can be custom made, you can order them yourself. And um, typically, typically TACMAN probes uh, have two different uh, fluorescent dyes. Um, they use uh, a dye called VIC, which is red, for the wild type allele. And then they use a different dye called FAM for the mutated DNA. Uh, and then, so what happens basically is you tag the DNA uh, and then you lay it onto the chip and then you do the PCR reaction in a flat block um, PCR machine. So the, the theory is that um, each well, uh, you know, 20,000 different wells, um, each well is going to contain at least one allele. It's either gonna take, contain the uh, wild type with the BIC or the uh, mutated allele with the FAM. Um, now, 
sometimes what happens is you get two two different allels in uh, you know you can get a vic and a fam in the same well and what happens then is you get a green color and if the well is empty you get an orange color so I'm going to show you some examples of that uh, next slide please so here's a perfect example of a uh, a um, digital PCR uh, with as you can see it's all orange and that means uh, no amplification. So that's typically what you would see with a negative control such as water. Uh, next slide. Now here's an example of a wild type allele. And so in this case, it was the, uh, the normal version, the healthy version. And on the left, you see the no amplification. That's um, you know the, the wells that have the water. And then on the right, you see the VIC, which is a wild type. And so there's roughly about 2,093 different wells filled with that. And so this is typically what you will see from a healthy person. Um, you won't see any FAM because the FAM tags the mutated allele. And uh, you'll, see, you'll typically see a ratio like this. Now, I do have to say, um, prior to using the Norgen products, we were, from a healthy, a healthy donor, we were probably getting about maybe two, 200, 300 uh, VICs. Um, and, you know, once we started using the Norgen products and using their, their flow with their tubes and their um, extraction kits, we immediately started getting in that, you know, 1,500 to 3,000 range for VIX. So it was great to see that. Next slide. So what we also do is we create a positive control. And so we, we run in total, we run seven different chips. We run a negative control of water. We run a uh, what's called a CEPH which is a previous slide you saw. That's actually a human genome that we know doesn't have any of the mutations we're testing for. And then we create, what we do is we sequence the individual and we look at the DNA surrounding the mutation. So about 150 base pairs, under, under 150, it's about 130 base pairs. And um, what we do is we create a probe um, that is exactly the same as the mutated allele in that individual and we get a custom-made DNA string done. And so, yes, you can do that. I'm sure many of you have done this before, get a custom-made DNA. You just submit the sequence and you, you get this string back and it's you know, a couple hundred dollars. So in this particular case, um, we used, we, this is our own custom um, positive control. And as you can see, um, we're getting a nice amount of the FAM, which is a mutated allele. And we wanna have you know, concentrations that are, that are fairly similar. And so um, this, is a, this is a good example of that. This worked out fairly well. Next slide, please. Now here's a case of a patient with late stage cancer. Unfortunately, the patient passed soon after this. And as you can see, um, you know, the FAM is incredibly high compared to the VIC. So if you look at the top of the blue, that's the, um, that's the cancer causing allele. And if you look at the red at the bottom, that's the wild type allele. And then of course the green, is uh, wells that have both the FAM and the VIC in them. And so we include that in our calculations too. So, um, you know, in this case, it was incredibly high. The patient, I think it was like what, 45% at, uh, in the blood. Um, and so obviously that's a fairly advanced stage. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna give you some examples here um, of how we've used this in monitoring cancer patients. So this is a cancer patient um, that came to us. We did tumor DNA sequencing. We didn't find too many um, targetable mutations. We didn't really find too many mutations that were what we call an early progenitor. So if you want to have um, a good, uh, a good, you know, monitoring um, a gene, you want to pick one that's one of the first four genes that is involved in transformation. As you know, I'm sure um, transformation involves at least four altered genes in humans, uh, three in mice, because mice have activated telomerase. Um, but um, uh, you want to pick one of those early mutations, you know, KRAS or, or BRAF or something in the PIK, 3KA or, or RAS pathway, or also a tumor suppressor gene, because those are also involved in early transformation. In this particular case, uh, we couldn't find any, but we did find this variant of unknown significance. So a variant of unknown significance, I'm sure you've seen them all before. Basically, that's just a mutation that is in a gene involved with cancer, but we don't quite know if there's enough evidence to say that it's pathogenic or not. So what we do is we do a fairly extensive workup. We use about uh, 10 or 12 different online modeling programs 
Um, I'm sure you've seen them before. There's, there's many different ones. And then we also do sequence conservation. So we will look at this position in this gene and we'll do sequence conservation over a bunch of different mammals and a bunch of different primates, which are our closest living relatives. And the concept there is if that, um, if any change at that base pair was allowed over evolution, you know, from mammals and primates, then um, it's probably not a pathogenic mutation. However, if it's highly conserved and there's no changes in that base pair um, all the way through evolution, then we have a good idea that that's probably a pathogenic mutation. So in this particular case, um, our in, we call it an in silico analysis. Our in silico analysis concluded that this is more than likely a pathogenic mutation. So we started trying to use it to monitor this patient. And so if you look at the far left in October, um, we ran the test and we didn't really see anything. And that managed, that uh, that was very similar to um, CT scans and uh, you know the standard uh, blood work. And then all of a sudden the patient started developing a uh, increase, just over 5%. Now you see the error bars there. Um, that's the 95% confidence interval. It's very important to have that. So we do four different chips. And so if you know, one chip gets uh, more of the, the FAM or the VIC than the other chip, um, you know, we wanna have an average. And so that's where the 95% confidence interval comes in. And that's where um, uh, the error bars are. So you, you wanna look at the error bars too. You don't wanna just look at the size of the um, uh, expression or uh, amount concentration there. And so what we did in November is we showed this to his doctor and the doctor put the patient um, on an EGFR inhibitor. Um, and as you can see, over time, it worked quite well. And it worked for quite some time and then it started creeping up again. And so once again, um, we got the doctor to put the patient back on the EGFR inhibitor and uh, they got a continued response from that. Uh, next slide. So this is an example of a patient um, that came to us a few years ago, um, a very late stage estrogen positive breast cancer. Um, and, uh, the, you know, the doctor had done everything he could. He had tried every single drug and he was just out of options. And so the patient said, you know, I just want to, I want to try DNA sequencing to see if there's anything we can do. So we sequenced her genome and we found that she had a PIK um, P uh, 1047L mutation. This is an activating mutation, causes constitutive activation of the PIK pathway. Uh, in this particular case, uh, we were quite happy because we, you know, we, we uh, knew that uh, alpelacib is a new FDA approved drug at the time. It had been around for about a year and a half, FDA approved for about a year and a half. Um, and um, you know, we, we thought, great, we can get some more time for this patient. So we contacted the doctor. Uh, the doctor said, well, you know, I, I, I don't see this under my drug uh, approval. So, I'm not sure what to do. So we contact the drug company. We've done this many times before. We often contact the drug companies to try to get the drug under compassionate access. Um, you know, we've done this with many, many different drugs over the years. And so uh, the drug maker, uh, the rep, the Canadian rep said, you know, listen, we've been trying to get this in for, you know, um, for Health Canada for years and they just haven't budged on it. So uh, I'll give you the drug. I'll give any Canadian patient the drug for free. Um, and just, you know, let their doctors know. So of course I got on the horn and called all the doctors I know and said, hey, guess what? You know, start testing your, your patients for PIK because we can get the drug for free. So uh, within a few weeks, um, we, we got a Health Canada approval for it. Um, that wasn't too bad. Uh, it was a quick, you know, quick form to sign. And um, within a few weeks, a patient got Alpelacid. So uh, May 27th, this was just prior to the patient getting treatment. As you can see, uh, you know, very, very high amount of this PIK mutation. And she went on the drug and immediately went down and started feeling better and everything was going great. Unfortunately, she was very sick at that point in time and um, her liver was in rough shape and she started developing uh, you know, a very serious case of neutropenia. And so the doctor had to take her off the drug. And um, you know, as you can see, we did another test in September and by that time, you know, the, the drug had obviously stopped working and um, she passed soon after that, unfortunately. And next slide, please. So in this particular case, um, I'm, I'm sure all of you have heard of uh, immunotherapy. Uh, we were actually one of the first people to ever use pembrolizumab in Canada. We used it about seven years ago on a metastatic melanoma patient. This, it wasn't even FDA approved at the time. I contacted the drug company and um, they, gave us a, they gave us some 
some shots, sixty thousand dollars a shot. But unfor you know, unfortunately, but it worked so well, and the patient's still alive and cancer free today. Um, in this particular case, this patient called me up and said, "Hey, listen, you know, my doctor wants to take me off immune therapy. Uh, I feel great, uh, you know. I, I and but he says I'm progressing." And the doctor had done a PET CT, which is the gold standard for detecting cancer because it looks at metabolic activity. Um, it doesn't just look at shapes and shadows. It actually tells you whether um, a, a specific lump is metabolically active uh, based on the amount of the FDG that it uptakes. Um, and it can tell you if it's necrotic too. So we love to use PET CT. So the patient had a PET CT. Now, um, there's a, a phenomenon known as pseudoprogression with immune therapy. Uh, these are PD-1 inhibitors. Um, and so what can happen is uh, it reactivates the CD8 positive T cells within the tumor. Uh, basically, when you, when, a, when you take a drug like pembrolizumab, it blocks the, uh, blocks the PD-1, um, so it blocks the overexpression of the PD-1. And so therefore, the CD8 positive uh, uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes that are actually inside the tumor but have been shut off uh, by PD-1 um, from the tumor, um, get reactivated and they start multiplying. Now, tumor cells and immune cells use a lot of the same resources. And so if you do a PET CT and you have an active immune system inside of a tumor that's killing the tumor, uh, the, the PET CT is gonna look hot. It's because the uh, immune cells multiplying will take up and you know their high biological activity will take up a lot of the FDG. So um, that's what we call pseudoprogression. And often what happens is you'll see uh, the patient go on their immune therapy and all of a sudden a bunch of new lumps will show up and the, the other lumps will get bigger uh, and once again you know the PET CT will show that it's hot. Um, so often the new lumps are from uh, micrometastasis who are too small to be seen on imaging and then when they get bigger and blown up by the immune system uh, now you can see them. So this patient um, had been on immune therapy and she had felt great and um, a doctor wanted to take her off and said you know you're, you're progressing it's not working. So she had a KRAS T12D alteration. That's an activating mutation, very common one, uh, often found in non-small cell lung cancers. So we looked at the level of that, and we saw it was incredibly low, as you could see, you know, well below, uh, you know, two percent. And so we contacted the doctor and we said, "Listen, um, we think this patient is still responding to the drug. We think what you're seeing is pseudo progression." And sure enough, um, uh, the patient remained on the immune therapy. The doctor took a chance. I really appreciate that, that he did that. And uh, sure enough, it ended, ended up being pseudoprogression. And the patient ended up being on treatment for another 2.6 years, uh, which is great. Uh, and then obviously the immune therapy stopped working and they had to do uh, different uh, treatments. So uh, this is a great tool for detecting pseudoprogression. And, um, you know, we've been using it for that for quite some time now. I think this is a an opportunity here that the medical system has really missed um, because this is really the only tool that you can use to uh, determine pseudoprogression. And pseudoprogression is a huge problem in treatment with immune therapies. Uh, next slide, please. Now here's a case of a high-grade neuroendocrine cancer patient. So initially the patient, um, we did a fairly extensive uh, molecular workup on the patient. The patient didn't want to do chemo. They were very resistant. They were into alternative therapies. Um, and we took a sample of their KRAS G12 activating mutation. And as you can see, it was 22% before they got treatment. And we, um, part of our molecular analysis, we did a workup using RNA expression. And we found that, um, uh, that uh, the, the standard care chemotherapy drug for this patient uh, would work really well. And so we were able to convince the patient to give it a try. And as you can see, got an instant response, um, their tumor dropped right down to nothing. And it stayed low for many, many, uh, you know, quite quite some time. Um, and then uh, later on, uh, August uh, 2021, um, the patient started getting a, a recurrence uh, just after that December. Um, and so they went on chemo again. And then the patient said, you know, I'm done with the chemo. Oh, you know, I want to do something else. So there were some studies showing that um, uh, with high-grade neuroendocrine cancer, if you use dual immune therapy, a PD-1 inhibitor and a CTLA-4 inhibitor, um, about I think it's about 35% of patients got some sort of response. A lot of it was stable disease and you know partial response, but it was something that the patient could do, and they just weren't into doing any more chemo. So what we did was we got them on this dual immune therapy, um, and they started uh, they, they reported feeling great uh, and everything. 
and um, sure enough, they um, started showing signs of progression. Um, and so, you know, they wanted to see if it's pseudo progression. And so, as you can see on the far right, we tested their KRAS G12D mutation. And unfortunately, it was not pseudo progression. It was true progression. The patient wasn't responding to the immune therapy. And so, you know, we're able to get the patient off the immune therapy, which is very costly. Um, ipilimumab and, uh, you know, a PD1 inhibitor together uh, can, you know, can have a lot of side effects. Um, but also, it's a very costly combination. So, you know, we were able to show that, okay, this combination, while we were hoping it would work, it's unfortunately not working. And so then they had to go back on chemo. Uh, next slide, please. So what have we learned? And I think this is a, a really exciting time for, uh, for cancer uh, with exosomes. So one thing we've learned is that active cancer cells, in other words, ones that are um, going through metastasis, and you know, if our goal of ctDNA is to identify whether a patient is responding or not. So you know, we want to know we're, our, our ctDNA um, uh, test is specific to a metastasis and activity. We don't pick. We, we try to um, focus on not getting um, DNA from apoptosis or necrosis or circulating tumor cells, um, and that's how our assay is very different from most other uh, liquid biopsies because they don't typically. Um, uh, focus on that. They just take all of the DNA and tell you what you have. So they're more of a discovery-based test, whereas we are a monitoring test specifically. Our test is not good for discovery. So what we know is active cancer cells release ctDNA, circulating through mean DNA, specifically under 150 base pair range via exosomes in order to spread that DNA. And we have seen um, lots of data to suggest that uh, that healthy cells could take up this DNA and actually get converted into uh, tumor cells, um, almost like a you know a vampire process. Um, and um, this happens. Um, and the other thing we learned from this is that not only do these exosomes spread um, activating oncogenes, but they also spread tumor suppressors. And so an alterated tumor suppressor. Um, can actually be used in in the sense to cause metastasis uh, and spread um, rather than just um, you know what we traditionally thought was it, they were just involved in um, in you know risk factor and and um, increased mutational burden but now we know that they're actually being used by cancer cells to actually metastasize um, the other thing we found out is that healthy cells release high levels of healthy DNA via exosomes in response to circulating tumor DNA. Now, this is a phenomenon we've noticed where we've seen increased BIC in patients right before they get a recurrence. And it's like the, it's like the healthy cells are trying to compete by releasing healthy exosomes to outcompete or you know, dilute the tumor exosomes. I think this is gonna be an exciting area. I haven't heard anybody talk about this before. And you know, we're not sure that that's actually what's going on. But um, I'd like to postulate that theory and uh, put it out there. So if anyone wants to you know, do some work on that, I think this is something that uh, should really be looked into. Um, you know, this, this potential competition of exosomes as a, as a way of um, our bodies fighting cancer. So uh, the other thing, our, our test is specific to disease causing process and is not confounded by DNA release from other sources like circulating tumor cells, apoptosis, lysis, et cetera. Next slide. So the clinical benefit of um, exosome-associated liquid biopsies, they can be used to determine drug response within eight to 10 days, uh, rather than standard care, which is you know, serial uh, measuring of uh, certain lumps um, uh, over a four month period of time using a CT scan or you know, MRI or something or PET CT. Um, and so you know, having the ability to test whether a drug is beneficial or not within eight to 10 days of starting it has huge implications in cancer. Um, you know, I think doctors are going to be much more willing to try a drug if they know um, it. You know, they can find out if it's working right away or not. And also, you know, standard imaging uh, for CT scans and so on, it's not really biologically conclusive. Um, so this process can greatly reduce the cost of drugs and prevent patients from taking the wrong drugs. Number two, it can be used to determine pseudo progression for immune therapy. Number three, it can be used to detect emerging treatment-resistant mutations. You know, classic example is the estrogen receptor one mutations in advanced breast cancers. Um, 
what you what can happen is the estrogen receptor can get mutated, and therefore, um, you know, the SERDs and the SERMs, uh, you know, won't be able to bind it anymore. Um, selective estrogen receptor modulators and degraders um, won't be able to bind it anymore because it's uh, altered its structure. Uh, and then uh, four, uh, it can be used to detect increased copy number variation. I think a classic example of this is, uh, you know, the HER2 expression. And so we know that, uh, you know, in some cases of, uh, let's say, estrogen positive breast cancer, um, patients will have like a very low HER2 as well. You know, they'll have like a, a you know, let's say a one plus HER2. And then over time, what can happen is that can go up to a, a two plus or a three plus. Um, and so you get this cross um, balancing between the estrogen and, and the HER2 receptor that we believe is actually a lot more common in cancers. Um, however, uh, if you're using a monoclonal body such as Herceptin or Pertuzumumab, you're not going to be able to bind um, a lot of, or you're not going to be able to really greatly affect a HER2 low. So if you have a two plus, that means you know a, a percentage of the tumor cells are going to have expression of the HER2 receptor, but not all of them. And so obviously a drug such as Herceptin, a monoclonal antibody, is only going to affect the ones that have that receptor, and it's not going to affect the ones that don't have it. So until now, HER2 low has kind of been ignored. Um, however, we now have these wonderful drugs, these conjugates that are a uh, you know an antibody or or typically a small molecule that is bound to a chemotherapy uh, molecule. And um, a classic example is TD or TDXD. It's a, a new drug. Basically, it's the antibody that binds to the HER2 receptor, and then it, it's a conjugate and it releases a, the um, uh, the chemotherapy compound into the cell, but it also has what's called bystander effect. It kills the neighboring cells. And so this drug is just knocking things out of the park in HER2 locations. So HER2 varies throughout tumors, within the same tumor, and through the course of the disease. And so this test can be used to detect copy number variation changes in HER2. And there's, there's other genes that that can happen in EGFR, you know, PIK3CA, um, you know, MET, lots of other genes that that can happen and so it's a great tool for detecting copy number variation changes um, both um, within a single tumor uh, between tumors in the body and through the course and change changes throughout the course of the disease in response to treatment next slide please i'm going to have to speed it up here i'm almost out of time so uh, where are we now well norgen's knocked it out of the park for us uh, it, they've allowed us to go to the next level so we have a, a next generation a robotic next, next generation uh, system and we do rna seq panel our rna seq panel though is a unique panel it's designed for expression whereas a traditional lumina based uh, rna seq is um, you know designed for um, detecting mutations as a series of amplicons um, ours has one applicon per gene, so it's not confounded by gene size or anything else. It's a great new tool. It's only been out for a short while. Um, and so we use it to look at expression. And so uh, with Norgen's help, and um, you know we've gone back and forth quite a bit, but they've been able to uh, um, get us enough RNA from exosomes. They've been able to purify um, exosomes from cancer patients for, uh, for us and um, get enough RNA, we convert it to cDNA, and then we do an expression. And so we look at uh, 22,000 or just under 22,000 transcribed RNAs. And so these are, um, you know, these are genes, these are oncogenes, these are tumor suppressors, these are um, short, uh, long coding RNA, uh, short coding RNA, uh, peewee RNA, microRNAs, um, uh, you know, lots of different types of RNAs. As you know, most, most RNA is transcribed. Um, pseudogenes, processed pseudogenes are an important thing. Um, uh, what you probably have heard is, you know, certain processed pseudogenes, like uh, P10, for example, has a processed pseudogene um, that was produced through retrotransposition. Um, in other words, it's got the gene, it just doesn't have the mechanism to turn it on. That's what a processed pseudogene is. Um, so what these do is these often act as a decoy for uh, microRNAs that would normally be used to shut off the P10. And so when patients uh, don't have this processed uh, pseudogene of the, of the P10 tumor suppressor gene, then um, the microRNAs are able to shut down the P10 much, much more easily. So these processed pseudogenes are an important thing. Um, we, we want to know if they're expressed um, because, and then there's also antisense uh, genes that can, um, you know, bind to a, uh, the RNA can bind to the gene. It's complementary and it can shut the gene down. 
So we, we, what we've done is we've created this panel. Now we've also had to create a uh, library because we can't use the databases for RNA expression. So we've created this library of different um, DNA or R, um, expression levels of different genes from different tissues using the same methodology. Next slide. Um, so since each tissue has its own different uh, normal expression level of these, uh, these coded RNAs, uh, what we do is we have a panel of all of the tissues for female and all of the tissues for males. Um, we've looked at the normal expression level using this panel. Um, and we look at 344 different targeted um, long coding and short coding RNAs and genes. Out of that, 85 of them are uh, targeted, have targeted drugs such as PIK, EGFR, you know, trope 2 for sacrituzumab, bovedecan, for example. And um, we've created this test and it looks at the relative expression level. So it allows us to potentially predict if a specific drug will be effective in a specific tissue um, or not based on the relative expression of that tissue in comparison to the uh, expression we've detected from the exosome um, RNA. Uh, our statistics right now, we're using is STAT1 and STAT2 that are commonly used in overexpression. You know, one is the average, the other is the highest peak. Uh, next slide, please. So this test um, that we've developed here is both diagnostic and predictive. So it can tell us whether there's cancer activity because these transcribed RNA panel that we use are only found in cancers. Some RNAs are overexpressed in some cancers and then not in others. Uh, we used a panel that was only expressed in cancers. And so we know if we see these at a certain level, we know there's cancer activity going on somewhere in the body. Um, so our current data so, so far shows that we can detect um, previously undetected cancers in active healthy individuals. Um, and it also detects uh, cancer activity or lack of in patients and healthy individuals. So it's another tool to determine whether they're responding to treatment or not. Next slide. Um, so um, one of the uh, limitations of this, our RNA expression um, from exosomes is, exosomes are typically only released in sick individuals. We don't see a lot of um, exosomes in healthy people. Um, so with our test, uh, when we gather the RNA from the exosomes in a healthy individual, um, the test usually fails. And that's because we have, you know, a large panel, uh, you know, just, just under 22,000 different probes uh, for RNA expression and sequencing. Um, and we require at least five to six million reads. So typically, if we have a healthy individual, we'll only get, you know, maybe two or three or, you know, 1.8 million reads from the exosome RNA. And then we know that that person doesn't have cancer because that's just not enough, uh, you know, RNA for a diseased situation. Um, and also, um, it doesn't quite capture the depth of tissue RNA-seq, which is really uh, another tool we love using. Uh, next slide. And so here's a perfect example of some of the cases here. And so what we've done is we've looked at a variety of different cancers here, uh, different cancer patients. Some were on treatment, some were responding, some, were, some weren't responding. And what we do is we combine um, the two statistics, called the STAT1 and the STAT2, and we add them together and we come up with what we call a combined positive score. And so what we found is if a patient or person um, is uh, in remission, then their combined positive score is going to be 200 or under. Um, and if you scroll down, you can see there's an example of a patient or, that we had that didn't have cancer. Um, it was a, you know, a negative control. And um, they're near the bottom, about six lines up. And you can see that their combined positive score is 165. Uh, whereas if you scroll down a little bit below that, um, you know, there's a person who's be progressing on the drug they're on. And you can see they've got an incredibly high combined positive score. So um, this is just some of our, uh, you know, some of our proofs that we've been working on. Next slide, please. So um, just to boil back to uh, Norgen's um, flow. So basically everything we do is in the downstream application. Um, and, uh, you know, Norgen's just knocked it out of the park for the first two areas, you know, collection and preservation and purification. So, um, I, you know, I think this is just a great tool. It applies to so many different, uh, uh, you know, situations. And uh, I don't think we could have done what we have done without Norton's help. Next slide. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Alex, for joining us today and Dr. Abdallah as well for those wonderful presentations. So now um, in a minute, we're going to move into the interactive Q&A session. So we'll give everyone a few seconds to enter their questions in the chat box. If we don't get to your question today, we'll make sure to follow up with you uh, very shortly by email. And I'd also like to note uh, that if you're interested in downloading the Liquid Biopsy Solutions booklet or any of our supplementary material, you can view those in the handouts tab on your viewer. Okay, so we will just give it one more minute here for the questions to come in. Okay, so we have a few questions coming in already. So uh, let's start with this question from Raul from Spain. So he's asking, um, could this methodology be transferred to low volume plasma samples? For example, those coming from preterm newborns around 150 microliters. So I think Moment, if, if you'd like to address this one, that would be great. Thank you for the question. And uh, yes, it can be transferred to very low amount of uh, sample or low, very low volume of sample. Uh, we have optimized our uh, purification uh, methodology, which is silicon carbide based methodology, uh, which is a spin column, uh, regular spin column that is uh, that contains our silicon carbide. It can uh, isolate or purify uh, small RNA or cell-free RNA from uh, as low as uh, 50 microliter of plasma and we uh, optimize our procedure in order if you are using very low uh, sample volume you can elute in as low as uh, 10 microliter of uh, RNA which is gonna be very concentrated and very clean uh, so yes we, you can do this as well as for the collection uh, the collection uh, you can collect from as low as 1 ml of plasma up to 8.4 ml of plasma in our tubes. Uh, the only thing that you need to do if you are collecting less than 8.4 ml of plasma, which is the capacity of the uh, tube, is that you have to fill up the volume of the, of the tube before plasma collection uh, to a specific volume in order to uh, get rid of or to dilute the, the preservative or the chemistry uh, before uh, the purification of the RNA in order not to co-elute any of the component of the preservative itself or the chemistry within your with your RNA so you have clean RNA. Uh, we are working currently with uh, a project with one of our customers through our services uh, for uh, the collection uh, and the isolation of RNA from um, um, neonates and it's a very low uh, amount of uh, blood so it, it, it can be done 100% we can discuss this in more detail uh, your project in more details and then we can um, help you with it. That's great. Thanks so much, Momen, um, for that comprehensive answer. So the next question we have is from Anna in Canada as well. Um, and I'll direct this one to Alex. So she's wondering why isn't this type of testing included in the current standard of care for patients in, in Canada? <clears throat> you know, that's a great question. Um, I think uh, you know, standard of care uh, is different wherever you go. So the standard of care, um, you know, in Canada is fairly uniform. Uh, but uh, if you go to the States or you go to Europe or Australia, they have very different levels of standard of care. Um, I think the big problem and, um, you know, I think the having the FDA approve a next generation sequencing test such as Foundation One is basically telling us that you know, everyone with cancer should get next generation sequencing, tumor DNA sequencing. I think it's a must for every cancer. Um, unfortunately, Canada can't afford that right now. I mean, we can't even afford PET CTs for everyone. We have like 25 machines and, and you know, I mean, Washington State below us has like, you know, 500, 600 different machines. So we have a free system that's really focused on uh, emergency health and it does a great job with that. Well, up until recently. Um, and, you know, there's not a lot of um, emphasis put into cancer, unfortunately. And also, a lot of Canadians um, will go down to the States or go elsewhere for treatment and they'll get the, you know, or they can order the next generation sequencing then. 
Um, I, I see this as changing, but um, it has to, you know, it. I think it's going to be part of the future, but um, it's just not here yet in Canada. Okay. Thank you so much, Alex. And our next question, this one is also from Momen. So we have Felix from Spain asking, how does time and condition of sampling and human variability, circadian rhythm, circadian rhythm, sorry, et cetera, affect uh, results in the profile you're going to see? So uh, plasma or liquid biopsy in general, uh, it's highly variable. The content of the plasma or liquid biopsy is highly variable. And this depends on lots of uh, the conditions um, like the uh, time of sample collection, the health status of the patient or the donor, uh, age, sex, diet. Uh, the best the best method is, is to control. You you must have lots of exclusion criteria uh, when you are collecting the sample. Uh, if you are studying a certain disease, you don't want this donor to have any other disease that will may. Um, bias your sample, uh, the time of sample collection, if it can be controlled, the sample volume, if it's going to be controlled, uh, the sample, the time of uh, sample collection, as I mentioned, uh, the age, there are lots of things that may affect this. So if uh, you are considering to start a project, you have to have certain criteria uh, to follow to uh, control and normalize for the output. Uh, so this is has nothing to do with that with the purification itself or the, with the collection. Uh, the collection and preservation is not going to count for age, diet, sex, whatever is in the plasma is going to be purified. Uh, we can help you with this as well. Uh, we do have lots of experience with our uh, scientific team and our services where you can have a free consultation uh, time with us. And then uh, um, I believe we have been doing this for lots of customers uh, now uh, to, uh, to discuss their project and to give them some recommendations for the sample volume, the sample type, the time of sample collection uh, to have more control over the outcome. Uh, but uh, even if every, if everything was controlled, the outcome is also going to be highly variable <laughs> because the, uh, the the nature of the sample type itself it is highly variable. Uh, the good thing about our collection and preservation and isolation that is going to maintain the uh, the profile of the nucleic acid at the time of sample collection. Uh, without any uh, cross-linking, for example. We don't use any fixative in our plasma uh, preservative. So this is uh, going to be very good for the quality of the DNA. Unlike others, use sometimes formaldehyde or uh, some sort of fixative, which will affect uh, the outcome. Uh, our uh, purification uh, is not, doesn't have a bias. So it's going to be uh, whatever is in the sample at the time of sample collection, you're going to recover it. Uh, prior to this, it needs some uh, consideration first uh, for the type of sample collection and uh, age and diet and sex and some exclusion criteria to exclude any uh, uh, any factor that can affect or bias the sample the outcome. Thank you. Thanks, Momin. And actually, we have another question just came in from Lydia that maybe you can add to. Um, she's wondering how Norgen's tubes actually work to preserve the CFDNA, CFRNA for 30 days. So um, I think some of the more technical details there. Good question. Thank you. So our our chemistry is a very unique chemistry. As you see, it doesn't preserve one uh, type of nucleic acid. It preserves everything. So the chemistry itself has been optimized where once the blood come in contact with the preservative, uh, the chemistry will gather all the cells and form a, a, a clot-like structure. It's not clotting, but it's a clot-like structure. So the cells now gather together and will move in the tube uh, during transportation as one big uh, uh, structure. So the cells are not going to be hitting each other, uh, causing hemolysis and the release of the nucleic acid in the plasma. 
as uh, Alex was mentioning, these uh, uh, the ctDNA, for example, they are very short fragments and they are located uh, found in very uh, small concentrations. If the cells release their nucleic acid content, then uh, this nucleic acid, cellular nucleic acid content may um, mask uh, the low abundant uh, ctDNA. So um, with our chemistry, uh, that uh, prevent hemolysis, prevent uh, the uh, release of the genomic DNA or the genomic content or the nucleic acid content in the plasma uh, may will 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 uh, first of all uh, will give you the highest plasma volume recovery, uh, which is between uh, five and a half and six, sometimes six and a half ml of plasma, with or without uh, shipping. Uh, in addition to this, uh, the purity of the uh, plasma is going to be uh, high enough uh, in order to have a good quality nucleic acid, and this is for 30 days at room temperature. Unfortunately, the chemistry itself is proprietary. I cannot disclose the component, but it's a very unique chemistry. It's completely different from uh, the chemistry that is uh, on the market right now with uh, in, in different uh, sample uh, preservation devices. Great. Thank you so much, Bowman. Uh, we have a good question here from Moran. So maybe, I don't know if both of you want to speak to this, but um, they're asking if it's possible to use liquid biopsy for screening programs for early cancer detection. Um, I can answer that. Uh, yes, most definitely. I think it's one of the best tools for that. Um, it allows you, I mean, uh, imaging like CTs and so on, they kind of have a, a limit of about a half a centimeter, you know, a few millimeters. Um, and they don't necessarily show biological activity. If you're looking for the hallmark features of cancer, such as mutations that only occur in cancer, like you know, activating mutations, you can detect these at a very small amount. I mean, even our chip-based technology, um, it detects, in theory, it detects uh, one piece of mutated DNA out of 20,000. And that, that's how many wells it has. The reality is, is it's actually probably more like about 18,000 wells that are usable. But yes, I, by all means, um, our data shows that we could detect it actually probably about six months prior to a lump being seen on imaging. I, I would like to add as well that uh, liquid biopsy is becoming a very useful tool uh, right now for the early detection of cancer. Uh, during our uh, services and the number of uh, researchers and labs that we are dealing with, uh, they are using a variety of uh, sample types like urine, uh, cerebrospinal fluid, plasma, uh, for the early detection of cancer. They are conducting some clinical trials and we are performing some of these uh, uh, experiments for them uh, with our services team. Um, and uh, the type of uh, sample uh, or the liquid biopsy um, sometimes doesn't have anything to do with the location of the cancer itself. Uh, some people, they are using urine to for the early detection of brain tumors or plasma for the brain tumor. Personally, uh, during my PhD, I was doing liver cancer biomarker, early detection of liver cancer from urine. So uh, it depends on uh, the feasibility of the study, uh, what you need from the liquid biopsy, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, to have all the possible uh, scenarios to control uh, the sample collection uh, and in order to, uh, to get the desired outcome. Uh, so liquid biopsy itself, yes, it can be used for uh, the early detection of cancer, depending on what you want to do with it. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, so we're getting a lot of great questions today. I think we'll uh, do one more, and then if we haven't had time today to get to your question, we'll make sure we follow up with you by email. Uh, so to end it, we have a question from Amber. And she's asking, is it important to differentiate the exosome, CFDNA? How feasible would it be? So, Moment, maybe you could speak a bit to the difference between exosomal RNA, um, C cell free DNA, and the different components there that you're going to find. Uh, I thank you so much. I think also Alice can uh, um, 
discuss this question with me as well. So, uh, um, free DNA or uh, plasma uh, in regards to DNA, uh, it has uh, sh very short fragments of DNA, uh, around 140 to 200 base pair. Uh, the, uh, the size, of course, of the ctDNA has uh, Alex mentioned is a little bit smaller than the cell-free normal cell-free DNA. Um, so this is the uh, the type of DNA in the plasma. Uh, exosomes and other vesicles uh, may contain DNA. There are apoptotic bodies. This is another type of uh, extracellular vesicle. There are ectosomes. There are these uh, the exosomes. And as Alex mentioned, the DNA is uh, located on the surface of the exosomes or attached to the exosomes. And uh, so these are the different types of uh, the DNA in the in the in the plasma. With our technology, uh, you can either get total cell-free DNA from uh, plasma using one of our kits, which is the plasma serum RNA, plasma serum cell-free DNA. <laughs> this will give you. Uh, everything in the plasma uh, being uh, exosomal or attached to exosomes or uh, uh, freely circulating in the in the plasma uh, the protein bound DNA or uh, if you want to uh, differentiate between them uh, you can get uh, you can purify exosomes as we do with Alex uh, we do the purification of exosomes separately uh, as an intact exosomes, and then out of this, we do the cell DNA or the DNA isolation. Uh, but in order to segregate both away from each other, currently it is not feasible. Uh, what is feasible uh, related to this is the RNA. We do have a, a method or a, a procedure that can uh, get you the cell free RNA, uh, which are that protein bound RNA uh, outside the exosomes and the in, in one illusion or in one uh, or in one illusion separated from the exosomal RNA so now you're going to have from the same sample uh, two different illusions using the same method uh, one contains the RNA inside the exosomes and one will contain the RNA outside the exosomes uh, this is uh, as a, a two in one kit uh, but for the DNA, uh, you have to get only the, uh, the total cell-free DNA that includes the protein-bound DNA outside the exosomes plus the DNA on the surface of the exosomes or uh, get the exosomes intact and then get the DNA out of it. Alex, if you want to add anything to it. You know, I think you've summed it up perfectly there, um, Dr. Abdallah. Uh, the only thing I would just say is size matters. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both so much today um, for speaking, and thank you everyone for attending. Our next webinar will be on March 22nd, and stay tuned for announcements on that. Uh, we hope to see you there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.